welcome to the UI. Um, dear Nicholas, dear everybody, I'm really happy to see you all here in this cozy setup and many researchers and uh, notwithstanding the rain, you made it from different villas. I'm really happy to start uh, the EY conversation. This is the first episode. Uh, when I arrived, I really wanted to um, engage between the different departments, the different units, and to have meaningful conversations going beyond what we do um, regularly with our research and, uh, and have really discussions about the most pressing questions of our times, but go deeper than just um, sort of regular disciplinary uh, research. So I'm very happy to have you here. Uh, and uh, um, we have, after the, the session, there will be a, um, a podcast uh, of two researchers digesting and sort of interpreting everything which has been said. Uh, so I'm very happy to have something which goes on afterwards and which will stay. Um, and with this, I would pass on to Nicola. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. I, I have my hand. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you everyone for coming despite the rain. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Nicolas Guillot. I'm a professor in the history department. Before introducing our guests, I want to say a few things about this new event series, uh, which is called the UI Conversations. And uh, the idea, as Patricia just said, is to create a space for uh, meaningful, rich discussions, going, uh, cutting across departments, involving all of the EUI community uh, in a way that is slightly more informal than the traditional academic setup of the paper delivery, the lecture given, uh, the talk pronounced followed by a standard Q&A. Um, we want to have something a bit more interactive. And in order to do this, as you can see, there's a brand new setup, which is very cozy. And I want to say a big thank you to the communication team that put a lot of uh, thinking into this. And the concept is essentially a fireside chat. So, um, and it's only, you have to imagine a fireplace, and it's only out of consideration for the cardiovascular health of uh, our safety and security director, Giovanni De Santis, that we didn't put an actual fire, wood burning fireplace in this room with only one exit and no fire escape. But you have to imagine one. And um, the, uh, to help us transition away from the more academic type of uh, presentation towards something more conversational, uh, the, the, the time today will be organized in the following way. We'll start a conversation with our guest, and then every 15, 20 minutes or so, we'll uh, mount a pose and open up in order for, to, to have questions or even comments and a back and forth with hopefully as many of you as possible. And this will go along uh, throughout this, this event. So with no further ado, I will introduce our guests. And because our conversation starts around a book, I want to introduce first its author. It's a great pleasure to have Adam Schatz uh, with us today. Uh, Adam is a New York-based uh, writer. And if you read the New York Review of Books or the London Review of Books, you're probably familiar with Adam's uh, writing. He's also the US editor of the London Review of Books. The range of his interests is quite amazing, and he goes from jazz to literature, uh, music, art, uh, of obviously politics. And it's also full of surprises. No late, later than yesterday, I was reading an essay, um, uh, actually an amazing and quite moving essay about uh, his uh, relationship and his lifelong passion for cooking, uh, which is a wonderful <laughs> essay. But he's, of, of course, a keen commentator on political issues. And in the past year, he has made uh, some important interventions about Israel and Palestine, and I'm sure we'll talk about this too. The, last, the latest one is from two days ago. It's a piece in the LRB called Atem um, uh, But it's a topic he's been writing about for many years, actually, not since the last year. He has published three books, uh, Prophets, uh, Outcasts, A Century of Dissident Jewish Writing About Zionism in Israel in 2004. Um, then a collection of essays, Writers and Missionaries, Essays on the Radical Imagination, published by Verso in 2023. Uh, and today we'll talk about his latest book, The Rebels Clinic, The Revolutionary Lives of Hans Fanning. That's uh, the book, and we'll see it in a minute. And then joining me today, it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, my old friend, Nadia Mazuki. I remember that the first time we met was 25, 26 years ago here yep. at the EUI. <laughs> Um, Nadia is a senior researcher at the CNRS and at Sciences Po in Paris. Uh, she's joining us redux from a year at Princeton, uh, the Institute for Advanced Study. 
she has held distinct positions at Harvard Kennedy School and at Yale. Um, and she was, last but not least, she was a Jean Monnet Fellow here in 2010 to 2012, and then she worked on a, an ERC project uh, uh, led by our colleague Olivier Roy until 2016. She has a long record of publications, and I'll just mention two briefly. She is the, the editor of um, uh, the Handbook on Religion and Populism, published by Ralph Ledge, uh, a fourth former editor with, with Ralph Ledge. And she has written uh, a book for Columbia University Press titled Islam and American Religion. Um, she is a regular contributor to uh, newspapers. She, she has written for Le Monde, the New York Times, the Boston Review, and she's one of the most interesting voices today about the intersection of politics and religion. And if you're interested in that, I encourage you to read Nadia and maybe get a hold of her on the reception after, um, after the, uh, the talk. Um, so with this said, um, I would like to uh, ask you to join me in welcoming our guest today, Adam. <laughs> So we'll, we'll start talking about a book, and I would like to uh, maybe say a few things about this book, Adam. I, uh, it's, as you can see, it's uh, a, a big book. It's a, it's a great book. It reads uh, like a novel. Um, first, because Adam writes extremely well, and I'm not paying lip service, it's truly remarkable. But also because the subject lends itself to this sort of uh, dramatic suspense. Uh, Franz Fanon was a soldier. He was a psychiatrist. He was a revolutionary, he was, uh, he was many things, and many things that don't always congeal. Um, so uh, the book is um, will, it's, it's available now in French, La Découverte published it. I don't know whether there are other uh, translations. Uh, Spanish, um, I think there are about eight or nine translations prepare, being prepared. So it's, yeah, it's, well that's, that's yeah. I mean, as you can see, it's, 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 uh, it's going to be a reference book on, on Fanon. Um, perhaps, in order for you, and I assume not everyone has read the book, I also want to add there's a number of copies in the library, not least because of some of my researchers taking my class notes on the syllabus. Uh, so it's available here. Um, maybe we could ask you, Adam, to read an extract so we all get a feel of the texture of the writing. Sure. I put my reading glasses on. Uh, but first, I just want to thank you, Nicola, for inviting me. I want to thank uh, Nadia is an old friend, and so I'm delighted to be sharing the stage with her. And I also want to thank Patricia and the Institute. It's a real pleasure to be here. I'm very pleased to be in Florence. Um, I'm going to read a, a passage from the book that um, uh, gives, I think, a more intimate view of, of Fanon. This book, of course, is preoccupied with Fanon's involvement in psychiatry and politics and revolution intellectual life, but I also try throughout the book to give people a sense of what the lived experience of Fanon, what it was like to be Fanon um, insofar as it's possible. And so this is um, an excerpt um, about, uh, uh, that takes place in the late 1950s in Tunisia. Fanon was uh, working for the provisional government of the Algerian Republic and also practicing psychiatry. And uh, his, his um, secretary was a woman named Marie-Jeanne Manuelin, who died in 2019. And I was lucky to uh, become quite close to her in the years before uh, she, she died. And uh, Marie-Jeanne was a confidant of his. Um, he dictated his last two books to her, A Dying Colonialism and uh, The Wretched of the Earth. And Fanon and his wife, Josie, became friendly with Marie-Jeanne and her husband, um, uh, who was an engineer. So one night in, and I should also mention that there's a reference to someone named Abdelafid Boussaf, who was the head of Algeria's intelligence services, very um, influential person in the Algerian movement. Um, one night in 1959, the Fanons and the Manuelans went to see Alain René's new film, Hiroshima Mon Amour, at the Rotonde, near the cathedral of Saint-Vincent-de-Paul. Saint Vincent Fanon, who suffered from myopia but refused to wear glasses because he found them to be an encumbrance, insisted on sitting in the front row. Josie, Fanon's wife, 
uh, declared that she wasn't going to ruin her eyes and sat farther back, leaving Marie-Jeanne beside Fanon. In Rene's film, Emmanuel Riva plays an actress who's come to Hiroshima to make a film about the impact of the bomb. There she falls for a Japanese man and finds herself flooded with memories of the war when she had an affair with a German soldier, a clandestine relationship that led to her humiliating punishment, the public shaving of her hair at the liberation. Fanon asked Marie-Jeanne what she made of the film. She replied that its treatment of trauma and repression reminded her of psychoanalysis. To forget her experience, she explained, Riva's character must first remember and name it. What's repressed is something we can't remember, Manuelon said, and yet the repressed is still there, alive, but only in our dreams. She compared the experience of repression to the amputation of a part of oneself. Fanon, who had always been drawn to the metaphor of amputation and phantom limbs, was overjoyed by her explanations. He said to me, you make me happy, I've taught you something. Fanon also loved the film, but in Manuelon's view, it resonated with him for another reason its depiction of what he called contingent or parallel love, a somewhat grand philosophical term for the kind of dalliances that Sartre and Beauvoir both permitted themselves so long as those dalliances were not a threat to their own enduring bond. Fanon believed that jealous people were dangerous paranoids and that jealousy was, quote, an evil to be eliminated so that humans could be truly adults. You know, polyamory was not invented yesterday. Um, at one dinner at the Manuelon's apartment, Fanon said that he hoped to be able to approach a man and say, I would like to share a slice of life with your wife if she's in agreement without this having any effect on what binds me to my wife or what binds you to yours. It doesn't take away anything from you. On the contrary, it's a gain since no one is anyone else's property. Everyone can live in liberty. Everyone is the sole proprietor of their freedom. This isn't easy, but this is true love. Did he encourage Josie to pursue her own parallel loves? Marie-Jeanne didn't say, but Josie seems to have taken a lover, an official in the FLN, when her husband's absences grew more frequent. We were all as serious as he was, Manuelon recalled, weighing the pros and cons while peeling our blood oranges at the table. Josie defended her husband's position while the others objected that, quote, not everyone could be Sartre and Beauvoir. Fanon replied that contingent love was in any case impossible now to put into practice. We need to make the revolution first. Fanon never approached Gilbert, that's Manuelon's husband, with such a proposal, but an attraction, if not a parallel love, had begun to stir between the doctor and his secretary. Marie-Jeanne did not find him handsome, but, quote, he was naturally elegant and seductive, and one day her hand accidentally brushed against his cheek. His skin was warm, and Fanon replied to her touch, embracing her. They went to a hotel, but as soon as they arrived, he hesitated and said he could not go in. Why? Because I am black, he replied, meaning that he would inevitably be seen and noticed, quite possibly by one of Abdel Abdelafid Boussaf's spies in the so-called mobile brigades. They were all being watched, Marie-Jeanne recalled, and he could not take the risk. It was not a question of power, he had none, but he didn't want his reputation to be sullied. They made one more attempt a few weeks later when they got into a car and drove to the empty house of friends in La Marsa, to which Fanon had keys. We didn't even have time to take our clothes off when there was a knock on the door, Manuelon recalled. It was the gardener. They took the interruption as an omen and drove home. Manuelon told me they never had an affair, but added mischievously that even if they had, she would never reveal the secret. Whether or not a relationship ever materialized, a collaboration did. Fanon spoke his books. Marie-Jeanne Manuelon, his so-called tape recorder, was the first to write them down. Thank you. So I think it's a good introduction. It gives you a sense of, first of all, Adam's writing, but also how the intimate details of this book, the extremely well-researched, also mesh with wider political, social, and cultural issues of his blackness in this very, uh, in this very particular scene. Before we move to the first question, Nadia, what do you think of the book? Do you have, do you, what's your, what was your, your impression the first time you read it? Uh, well, it was, um... It was absolutely fascinating, uh, almost like a, a, a psychoanalytical clinical account of the complexities of Fanon. Um, and um, 
I know you wrote, I think, somewhere that in order to engage into critical biographies, you have to um, to fall in love with the author you're writing about. And um, what what's really amazing in 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 your book, um, amongst so many other things, is that. At the end of the book, we, we know so much more about Fanon's multifaceted personality, and yet we're not so sure whether you stand <laughs> on that love-hate relationship <laughs> with Fanon. So, um, yeah, but uh, we're, we're so happy to have you here uh, and get a chance to have this conversation with you. It's, it's a great honor, and uh, thank you, Nicola, for having me, thank you to, to Professor Nance, to the EUI for organizing this. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be back to what feels like, like home. Uh, Nicola, I, I think I met you around 23 years ago. I was contemplating whether I should do my PhD here or at Sciences Po, and I chose Sciences Po because I wanted to work with this guy, <laughs> Professor Wa. Um, but I was so happy to be back. Oh, years, <laughs> years later. Anyway, let's jump in with the questions. Yeah. So maybe you should start with a very basic first question. You gave a number of talks about this book, uh, and I've read quite a few. And um, when you asked how you came to this project of writing this very substantial biography of Fanon, that also, I must say, sets the record straight on a number of historical mm -hmm. accounts, um, amazingly. You usually have a story about uh, rummaging in your father's library and finding the wretched of the earth lodge, if I remember, somewhere between Malcolm X and Isaac Deutscher. Um, <laughs> it's true. But that, okay, that, that gives us a sense of why you, you, know, you came to, to be interested in Fanon. But it doesn't tell us why now. So why mm -hmm. did you decide to write about Fanon in the past few years? and not earlier or later? In, uh, sure, I mean, I, I, I think this, the, the idea for this book was probably germinating for a number of years before I began uh, research on it. Um, my trajectory crossed, led me to cross paths with Fanon's name um, at so many points. Um, uh, in fact, some of the, the first interviews for this book were conducted in 2001 when I was researching a piece about the memory of torture in France. Um, uh, this was sparked by this, um, by the discussion of the memory of the Algerian War around uh, the memoirs of Paul Osares, uh, general in Fran a French general who took part in the repression of the Battle of Algiers and carried out the assassinations of Ali Boumengel, an FLN lawyer, and the, the leader, Larbi Ben Midi. Um, uh, there was also the interview that uh, Florence Boger, the Le Monde correspondent, conducted uh, with uh, Louisette Iguilariz, who, um, who along with her sister Malika had been a militant in the FLN, was arrested, was brutally tortured, and then many years later recounted her torture to Florence Boger because she was looking for this doctor, this doctor, I think it was Dr. Richaud. Uh, she wanted to contact the doctor who had saved her uh, from this agony, saved her life. Um, and I became fascinated uh, by the Algerian War um, in the late 90s, partly I think because it allowed me to think about some of the issues in the Israel-Palestine conflict um, in a different context. Um, and so uh, at that time I interviewed Alice Cherki um, who, a psychoanalyst in Paris from an Algerian Jewish family who had been Fanon's intern. I also interviewed Mohamed Harbi, a great Algerian historian who um, had been, um, uh, uh, who, had, who had worked for the FLN's uh, foreign ministry um, in Tunis uh, uh, during the war and then became a, a dissident, was thrown into jail after Ben Bella's uh, removal from power in 65. And so, um, when I, when I look back at it, I think, well, in a sense, I started researching this book you know, almost 20, you know, 25 years ago. Um, but the, um, the proximate cause, I guess, of the, of the book really wasn't about the political context. It was that uh, Robert Young, 
and Jean Calfa, two scholars, uh, published this extraordinary anthology of Fanon's psychiatric writings, as well as his early plays and various political writings that had never been collected. They published it with La Découverte. The book was called uh, Writings on Alienation and Freedom. And uh, I was struck by um, the fact that you could you found a different Fanon in this book. It wasn't simply Fanon the militant. It was Fanon uh, the young playwright, the young artist. It was Fanon the practitioner. Um, you had a more granular sense of what psychiatry meant in practice uh, for Fanon. And uh, I was so taken with this book that I ended up writing a long piece about Fanon for the London Review of Books. And then not long after the review appeared, uh, a writer friend of mine, Pankaj Mishra, said, Adam, I think that you might have a book here. And I started to think about it, and then I put together a proposal. And I think that, but I think that, um, you know, my desire to uh, write about Fanon uh, grew out of my interest in him as a committed intellectual, um, someone who uh, was determined to fuse theory and practice um, not because I wanted to present a, 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 yet another sterile, heroic image of, of Fanon, but rather because I wanted to look at the vicissitudes, the difficulties, the challenges, and the pitfalls of involving oneself in politics. I mean, I think this is an admiring account of Fanon, but it's not a hagiography. And I think it's those contradictions, contradictions and complexities that make him interesting, first of all, and that also remind us of how difficult and complex it is to transform our reality. It's not simply a matter of having the right answers. Actually putting these things into practice, it's not easy. And I think Fanon's writing is, is, um, is instructive um, in that regard as well. And it's true that, that there's a sort of contradiction between Fanon associated with violence, and completely through the preface by Saf and the this Fanon, who's a caretaker, a psychiatrist, as you said. Yeah, well, that's, well that's, 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 that's partly why I called this book the, um, the, the Rebels Clinic, The Revolutionary Lives of Fanon, because um, I wanted to underscore the tensions between uh, Fanon's rebelliousness, uh, rebellious character, his questioning of orthodoxies, his, his very profound belief, not only in collective freedom, but in individual freedom, on the one hand, um, and his uh, desire to uh, make an imprint on history and his willingness uh, to work within a highly bureaucratic and authoritarian structure, um, and even to accept that his work would, um, would mean not just revealing the truth, but at times concealing it, you know? And so um, that those, those tensions, I think, um, give the narrative some of its propulsion, some of its drive, because we can see that Fanon has to has to work them out. You know, it's you know he you know it's clear that Fanon was electrified by the Algerian struggle, but that he ended up in some ways being agonized by it as well. So there's a there's a tragic element uh, to the story. Um, I, I want to. Um, um go back to Algeria, but before we, we, we dive in the sort of substance of what, of what he said, he didn't say, um, I, I wanna push you a little more on, on, the, on the writing process. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wanna ask you uh, about your process as a writer in Conquering Fanon. Um, I, I think the book does an amazing job um, accounting for uh, Fanon's individual trajectory, how it's inscribed in this social context, and uh, you, you, you render the complexity, the joy, the sadness of, of, of multiple aspects of his life. Um, and in doing so, you manage to keep that, um, that sort of om almost like psychoanalytical tone of distance that contrasts a bit with your writing writings on jazz, on food, on Daoud, on, on other authors. That's why I was asking earlier the question about, <laughs> to, maybe you hate him by now, especially after all these book talks. And, <laughs> but um, I, I'd be curious to, to know a bit more about 
how you manage and as a writer this long companionship with Fanon and how you got to that, what comes across as a, as a distant tone, not, I don't say that as a critique, it's not detached, but that produces the whole beauty and force of mm. the final account, but it contrasts with some of your other writings and other mm. authors. And it's all the more interesting than you also, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think mentioned that this book is also a work of imagination. So it's based on tremendous amount of research and archive and interviews. You mentioned Alice Cherki and there are so many others. Uh, yet it's not, it's not just an account of all these interviews. You, you, you do something imaginative based on that, that yet remains very sort of distant. So mm. um, I would like mm. to know as a, a, a bit more about mm. the writing process to get to that, to that result. Well, it's an interesting question, Nadia. I, I, I'm not sure that, um, I mean, everyone is going to have a, a, a somewhat different experience um, of reading the book, um, depending on their own reaction, of course, to Fanon, who can, for, you know, who's a kind of Rorschach test for some people. Uh, I didn't think that I was more detached from Fanon than I have been from um, other figures uh, I've, I've written about. Maybe that does come through for, for you. Um, I feel that there are moments when um, it's clear that I'm quite sympathetic to him and others where I'm more skeptical or questioning. Um, uh, I think, you know, he's, he's many-sided and, I, and I, I wanted to be uh, on the one hand, I wanted to give as fair a portrait as I could um, of Fanon so that the reader can make up his or her own mind uh, about Fanon. And at the same time, I wanted it to be clear where I stood in relation to him. So um, I think that my, my perspective on him is pretty clear uh, uh, throughout the book. Um, uh, I didn't feel that I would be that I would be doing justice to Fanon by writing reverentially of his of his of his every move. I mean, some of the, some of Fanon's uh, decisions are, I think, questionable. Um, particularly, some of his political decisions um, in the late 1950s and early 60s. Well, just before his death, when he became quite enamored of figures like Holden Roberto, who was a um, was a CIA um, uh, agent essentially, or um, CIA contact um, in, in Angola. And, and also, of course, um, Fanon's relationship to Lumumba, which I think is a, is, is, is a complicated one. It's been romanticized, but it, it turns out to be rather more complicated than people have understood. Um, you know, I, I, I didn't really, I, didn't, I wouldn't say that I fell out of love with Fanon. I actually found that at each stage um, in the writing of the book, as I returned, incessantly to the, to the work itself, um, I became excited again about what he had to say. And it, it, it seemed to me as well that even at the moments where I was growing a little exasperated with him, as is inevitable when you're writing, spending you know, five or six years with the same person, um, I would encounter something that he'd written that would remind me of how protean and thrilling a thinker he was. Um, I mean, for example, when I was writing about Fanon and his relationship to the FLN bureaucracy um, in Tunis, when he was essentially um, presenting um, the official narrative um, of the war in ways that obscured some of the FLN's crimes. Um, meanwhile, he's carrying out this innovative and brilliant psychiatric work uh, with ordinary Tunisians, with, Al with, with, with Algerian refugees, with Algerian soldiers. And so in a sense, I fall in love with him a little bit again. Um, and I think it's that, it's not so much the, um, I wouldn't describe my relationship to him as being one of detachment so much as one that is um, dynamic and shifting, you know, depending on what he's doing or saying um, at a particular time. Um, now, I, you know, when I say that it's a work of imagination, I should be clear that I don't mean that anything is invented. You know, I'm, you know there's a, a school of historiography 
um, that has emerged in the last 10, 15, maybe 20 years um, associated with um, figures like Saidiya Hartman, who's you know, a very serious and interesting and innovative uh, thinker, and this is not a criticism, but it's a school of writing um, that encourages uh, historians, academic historians, to uh, become fabulous in a sense, to, to, to fill gaps in what they call the archive. I'm not doing that in this book. Nothing is invented. Um, but uh, it is an imaginative work um, insofar as I'm drawing upon my research and telling the story in a certain way and emphasizing some things more than I am, more than others. And, and, and draw, and, and particularly, I think what I would emphasize is the way that I read the work. Now, I was really influenced um, by a style of reading called symptomatic reading that, that, that uh, the French Marxist philosopher uh, uh, Louis Althusser proposed. Um, it was uh, something that I read about back in co college, you know, decades ago. And I, and I, I found it to be a very, productive way of thinking about writing. And, and what Althusser did essentially was to find these um, stimulating contradictions in a text that appeared to be completely coherent. And then he would use those to um, rethink what, what people had understood by you know, Marxism. You know? And uh, one of the things that he often emphasized in his quote unquote symptomatic readings uh, were what he called structuring absences, things that are somehow not in the text, but that actually shape it. And so I, it's not really a style of reading that one can apply methodically. I think it's, it's but it's a, it is a, a permission, I think, to think more creatively about how we understand texts that seem quite obvious. Now, Fanon wrote what are essentially pamphlets, as Marie-Jeanne Manuelin would say. She found it to be quite amusing that people would read uh, The Wretched of the Earth or, or L'Enceinte, La Révolution Algérienne as ph philosophical texts. Clearly they're not. And yet, there's something about Fanon's writing which is so intelligent and subtle and probing that its meanings exceed their, um, uh, the purpose for which they were intended at that moment. And, um, and so we find that there are meanings in there that we did not suspect. And that's what I try to do. I also have found that, um, that buried in these texts are autobiographical uh, references. Um, there are allusions to his life, you know, to what he was reading at the time. And so by just bearing down on those texts, I was able to find a lot of um, material that I did not necessarily suspect was there. So we'll get to uh, Fanon's legacy later in this conversation, but the first question I had in, with respect to that, you just mentioned you know, holes in the archives. You do an amazing job at bringing back to life a, a bygone era of anti-colonial thinking. You know, uh, concepts such as negritude that were constructed, it is a critique of that, and what's surprising, when you read the book, you realize how different it was back then. Uh, some of these concepts of, or ideas have just you know, disappeared. Negritude is not something you talk about. You talk about blackness, which is not the same thing, actually. No. And, and, and Fanon was critical of Negritude anyway. We, you know, uh, they read Sartre, who was a major reference of anti-colonial struggles and thinking. Today is not read that much. Um, maybe he should not, be. Maybe he should be. Maybe he should be. <laughs> or Albert Lenny, for that matter, which mm -hmm. maybe survives in Franklin's mm -hmm. circles as a reference, but not really any on the end world. And, and yet Fanon has remained as a reference. So I, my question to you would be, do you think, did we lose something in that process? Did what? Did we lose something? What was lost? And are there things worth retrieving? Yeah, no, no, I, 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 I think we probably did. And I think that this is one of the reasons why this book is not merely a biography of Fanon. It's, a, it's a, in a sense, a collective biography of a whole range of thinkers, um, activists, militants, philosophers, poets, who were thinking about the same set of questions, um, namely, uh, 
well, one, how do we, how do we overcome colonialism? Will colonialism produce these spectral effects? Will it last, will it outlast its own life? Um, how do we recreate the world? How do we, how do we reimagine politics in the aftermath of colonialism? Fanon was certainly one of the most creative thinkers to address these problems. And he was arguably the one thinker who could turn readers into revolutionaries. That's why we remember him. People read Fanon and they wanted to go out and fight. Uh, that's one of the reasons why he remained so popular, especially with young people. Um, what's more, uh, Fanon was, was a very poetic writer. Um, and there are so many uh, kind of revolutionary um, aphorisms and jingles in his work that are easily quoted. I mean, he's, in a sense, he's like, uh, he's like James Baldwin. He's, a, he's, an intel he's an intellectual for the age of social media. It's a movable feat of quotation. Exactly. Um, but there were other people who, some of whom were in conversation with Fanon, who were extremely interesting. And I wanted to remind people that they were also part of this conversation. I mean, Fanon is, of course, the star of this book and, and deserves to be. Um, but I also wanted to underscore the contributions um, of other people um, who had been forgotten, some of whom you've, you've mentioned, um, uh, Albert Memmi, certainly, but also um, uh, uh, figures like Mouloud Faraoun, who uh, was a remarkable uh, Berber writer, Kabil writer, uh, school teacher who was uh, murdered by the OAS in 1962, um, at the end of the Algerian War, uh, uh, wrote, a, wrote a, a wonderful uh, autobiographical novel called Le Fils du Pauvre, um, but who also uh, wrote this extraordinary diary about the Algerian uh, war, as experienced daily. And, and you know, if you want to understand what it was like to live in Algeria during the war, you're going to want to read Faraoun. Faraoun will tell you more than Fanon will. I mean, Fanon will give you this kind of dazzling set of reflections on the kind of historical meanings of the struggle or on the psychological dynamics of anti-colonial struggle. But if you want to know what it was like to be an Algerian caught up in this lethal conflict, you have to read Faraoun. And so the book was also an occasion to remind people of the richness of this, of this literature. And there are other figures too, like uh, Lyotard. You know, people tend to forget that Lyotard uh, was part of the socialism or barbarism circle and that he started out writing on Algeria. Many French intellectuals, in fact, Bourdieu, exactly, he's also in the book, uh, Derrida. Um, and I also uh, wanted to incorporate the work of black intellectuals, black American intellectuals um, who influenced Fanon. One of them, of course, was Richard Wright. Sure. Uh, you know, Fanon's uh, uh, first book, Black Skin, White Mask, she published in uh, 1952 when he was 27 years old and, want, and tried to submit as, as his psychiatric dissertation. It was not accepted, of course, and he had to write a different dissertation. But in, in Black Skin, White Masks, many of the examples uh, that Fanon draws upon are not from his clinical studies. They're from literature. They're from Richard Wright. They're from Black Boy, Native Son. They're from Chester Himes. And so, um, and, and as it happens, and this is, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of a remarkable fact, uh, Richard Wright uh, was himself fascinated by the potential for, psychoan for psychoanalysis to shed light on the black condition in the states. Um, he was involved in this um, innovative project um, along with the uh, German Jewish leftist psychiatrist Frederick Wertham to set up a day clinic in Harlem, um, uh, the Lafarge Clinic, uh, named after the um, the son-in-law of Karl Marx, a guy who wrote a book called The Right to Be Lazy. Um, uh, maybe a right that we should revive. Um, sure. and, uh, um, and so Wright, you know, in fact, Fanon wrote to Wright in 1953 that he wanted to write a monograph on him. 
I don't think Wright ever replied uh, to the letter. Um, Fanon's note is quite a poignant one. He talks about how impressed he was by Richard Wright's books and he would like to speak to him. Um, a number of years later, Fanon, um, writing um, anonymously in El Mujahid, the Algerian uh, newspaper, uh, published uh, a scathing review of, of, um, of one of Richard Wright's books on African independence movements. Uh, he was very interested in Wright's work and felt that in many ways what black American writers were saying about race was more visceral, more powerful, and more meaningful than what he had read in a lot of in West Indian literature. And so did he meet Richard Wright? No, they, they were at the same conference in Paris in 1956, the Congress of, 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 of Black Writers and Artists uh, convened by Présence Africaine. Um, but it seemed to me that Richard Wright was still part of the Fanon universe. And so, um, and so he's in the book, yes. Um, I want to follow up on um, your comment about if you want to understand Algeria, read Faroon. And um, so you you end the book with this 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 these comments about you know whether it was or not whether Fanon's was an impossible life. Um, and uh, reading your account of Fanon's encounter with Algeria, I was I wanted to ask you about whether, at the end of the day, Algeria there was an impossibility of Algeria for Fanon um, in the sense that he comes across as, as that, that someone who desperately wants to, to love, to be Algerian, to, to be an insider, yet he remains always that outsider. He doesn't speak Arabic or Berber. He doesn't even try to learn. You say he relies on interpreters for his work. Mm -hmm. Um, and you mentioned uh, a number of times situations where uh, his FLN comrades, you know, are very proud of, of him and love him, and yet they, they say, well, I mean, he's still not one of the, one, yeah, of, one yeah. of us. And then he goes to, to Tunis and, and, and then to, to, to uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. So, so he, there's this, this insider-outsider positionality um, that's, that's, um, that's, that's intriguing and um, related to that, uh, I, I was really struck uh, with the, the blind spot of Islam in his thinking and um, his, his relationship to Islam, his approach to Islam is a sort of basic Marxian false consciousness or a, um, a factor of resistance when he looks at the unveiling of, of women. And in his exchange with Shariati that you, that you mentioned, he says very clearly that he doesn't believe in Islam as, a, as an important factor. And, and, and it's interesting, how could someone who's so, so smart, so, so engaged with Algerian society could <laughs> miss or dismiss <laughs> when people who are now way less cool than Fanon, like Jacques Berg or mm -hmm. whatever, uh, they understood, understood the centrality. Understood the centrality, and by no means do I mean to essentialize uh, and culturalize Algeria. By, but especially when you look at the aftermath of, of the, the impact of Islamo nationalism, Fanon just sees nationalism and doesn't understand that it's an Islamo nationalism and his relationship to the ulama, and it's, it's, it's just really intriguing. And so I'd love to hear your thoughts about, about that, that blind spot. And then maybe more broadly uh, to, to Nicolas' question about like why Fanon today, mm -hmm. does this pose the question of um, the, the, the exportability of the Algerian paradigm, if there is any, uh, to understand anti-imperialist struggles. And like, again, Fanon st strives so much to turn Algeria into a sort of global model of anti-imperialist struggle and yet it doesn't work. Like I think you, you said, you say it yourself, it's, I think it's so beautiful. Um, he seems to have discerned a people without white masks. They're, they're like, they say no to the white masks. And so how can you 
like maybe that's an element. And Islam is part of that. Right, exactly. It's a central part of that. And when you see sometimes now in, in some branches of decolonial thinking, sort of merging of all these models and applying Algeria to Southern America or whatnot, this really begs the question of the, 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 the transportability of these models and that maybe it's important to say that there is something irreducible to the Algerian mm. experience and be able to say that without saying that in culturalist terms. Mm. But I think this Fanon's contradiction in his relation to Islam and Algeria and these blind spots maybe suggests mm -hmm. some of that. Mm. So yeah, I'd love to hear your thoughts. That's about five questions. <laughs> um, <laughs> so so I'm gonna, <laughs> and they're 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 Absolutely. no, they're all they're yeah. all great questions, and I'll try to take I'll just try to deal with them one by one. Um, uh, I'll, I'll but I'll start with the question of, of of Fanon and his search for belonging, because this is one of the I mean this is a book made up of a number of. Um, of, of, of narratives, uh, shifting narratives. And certainly one of the narrative themes is Fanon's struggle uh, to belong. Um, uh, let's recall that uh, Fanon grows up thinking that he's French. You know, he's raised to think of himself as a French person, not a, a French person of color, but a French person. And, uh, you know, his parents uh, were very républicain, um, socialist. Uh, his understanding as a, as a child was that um, blacks were, were Africans. They were the tirailleurs sénégalais, you know, uh, some of whom he, uh, he met when, you know, when he was growing up in Fort de France. His father invited a group of, of, uh, of African riflemen to have dinner at the Fanon's house. Fanon um, admits that he was frightened of them at first. Um, and it's only uh, when Fanon uh, leaves uh, Fort de France um, and starts to and becomes an, you know becomes a, a soldier um, in the Free French Forces that he acquires um, a different understanding of the French Republic, the French Empire, his relationship to both. Um, as a soldier, uh, he's comparatively privileged. Um, uh, the, the African riflemen are eating different meals. They're wearing different uniforms. They are sent out to fight before anyone else. He's treated as, as an, honorary French, an honorary European, an honorary French person. But when he is fighting um, in, in, uh, in France, uh, he finds that um, after liberation, no French woman will dance with him. Um, and then he has this, this uh, shattering experience um, on a train, which, is, which furnishes the, uh, the, in a sense, the primal scene in, in Fanon's work um, and is the key episode uh, in the central chapter of Black Skin, White Mass, the lived experience of the black man, l'expérience vécu du noir. Um, and this shattering experience um, has Fanon on a train, probably going from Paris to Lyon where he studied. And this little white boy uh, 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 says to his mother, tiens maman, un nègre, I'm, I'm afraid. Um, and uh, Fanon is overcome with emotion. He, he feels as though he's um, disintegrating. He, he had no idea that he was even seen as black. And uh, this leads Fanon to immerse himself in the writings of negritude, in the writings of, at first at Songor. He talks of waiting in the irrational. Um, so going to France was very destabilizing for Fanon because he becomes aware that the door is shut. Ultimately, he is seen as a black man. He is seen as someone who has more in common in some way with the tirailleurs Senegalais than with the French people with whom he's in intellectual and academic conversation. So it, I agree that it is striking and in some ways psychologically curious that what Fanon ends up doing um, as he goes to Algeria and becomes part of the Algerian struggle what he ends up doing is in a sense to recreate the door in a different context, right? He's rejecting France and, be, and trying to become Algerian, to will himself 
um, to become Algerian. But he's also um, creating a new predicament for himself because he can never quite belong. And, and this is true of his relationship to Africans um, as well. He's always at a slight remove. Now, one of my arguments in this book is that because Fanon is always the stranger, he has certain epistemological privileges. He sees things that other people don't see, but it always places him at a slight remove. Now, what Fanon did in the, in the case of Algeria was to redefine what it meant to be Algerian. His argument essentially is that Algerian identity is a national identity in creation. It's in this, it, it, is, it is something that is coming into being. It's an identity of becoming, not being. It's not about the restoration of an Algerian personality that has been deracinated and suppressed. It's about the creation of a new Algerian identity through common struggle. Now, this was not um, a view of Algerian identity that was widely shared by Algerian Arabs and Berbers. There was, a, there was certainly a group of people either within or adjacent to the FLN who shared that view. And that was certainly true of some of the FLN people that Fanon ended up meeting. Um, uh, many of them were Kabyle Marxists, and they also had a very future-oriented understanding of, uh, of the, what they call the Algerian Revolution, that after the revolution, everything would be different. We would have this new, almost like a multi-ethnic citizenry where um, those French people, those European citizens who allied themselves with the FLN would be just as Algerian as the Algerian Muslim majority. Um, but this understanding of Algerian identity, I think, um, was that of a kind of radical minority within the FLN. On the whole, as you said, um, Algerian nationalism was defined by a kind of um, Islamic flavored national populism, which is essentially what what Mohammed Harbi um, has argued in his works on, on Algerian history. Um, Fanon uh, uh, never really confronts this. And, and it's true that it is an inconvenience uh, for his analysis. Um, the Shariati exchange is, um, is a historical conundrum because although it seems clear that Shariati did write to Fanon, it's not clear that that letter is authentic. And in, my, in the paperback edition to the book, I have a footnote on this. There are questions have been raised about the authenticity of Fanon's letter, and there is some suggestion that this letter, in fact, was written by Shariati. But, but even if the letter was written by Shariati, I think it's still revealing, because what it suggests is that Shariati himself was aware that Fanon's understanding of the Algerian struggle uh, did not privilege um, Islam. Um, the uh, chapter on Algeria called Algeria Unveiled in year five of the Algerian Revolution, Dying Colonialism, is probably uh, Fanon's most explicit attempt to explore uh, the question of, of religion. But even here, it turns out, uh, Fanon is evading the issue that you're referring to because essentially what Fanon argues is that to the extent that Algerian Islam is particularly rigid, um, it's because the French have had such a terribly heavy-handed presence in this country. They've attempted to deny the Algerian personality and as a result, um, Algerian Islam has become in a sense calcified. Um, so it was, you know, it, it, it calcified in reaction to the French colonial presence and to French colonial oppression. Um, he goes on to argue, of course, that that the veil itself is a kind of um, uh, symptom of the the dead weight of Algerian religion. And when I say this, by the way, I'm not endorsing this view. I think actually it's quite a facile view. But that was his argument, and and. Um, he goes on to say that, that when Algerian women remove the veil in, in combat, you know, they take off their, um, their hayek, they, start, they, 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 uh, they, they cross over um, into the European city, they deposit bombs, they, they deliver messages. His argument is that these women are, in a phenomenological sense, developing a new and liberated relationship to their bodies, that they're becoming free in the act of 
removing the veil and taking part in the anti-colonial struggle. So in, in effect, what Fanon is arguing is that the anti-colonial struggle is what will liberate women against not, not only the, the, French, the French colonizers, but against their own, patri uh, own patriarchal fathers. Um, one of the reasons that Fanon was so determined to make these arguments is that the French, at the very same time that he wrote this chapter, were putting themselves forward as the, as the great liberators of Algerian women. They were holding ceremonies in the streets of Algiers where Algerian women were, were unveiled. Either the Algerian women were removing the veil themselves or European women were doing it. And, and uh, the, Algerian, the French army's argument was that we are going to liberate you, not the FLN. If you choose the FLN, you're gonna end up more oppressed. Um, Fanon's argument is that revolution itself is a force of modernization. Now, of course, we know that, that it didn't turn out that way. But then, you know, the last turn in that, in that chapter, Fanon argues that because of these unveiling ceremonies, Algerian women, in reaction, begin to reassume the veil, only now the veil has acquired an entirely new meaning. It's no longer a symptom of a calcified religious culture. Now it is a symbol of defiance to an oppressor who wants to remove the veil forcibly. So even in this, I think, I th and I think there's, I mean, I, I think the chapter is fascinating, but the chapter is really a semiotics of the veil. It's, it, he treats the veil as this essentially, uh, uh, as a piece of cloth that has no inherent meaning and its meaning shifts according to the political context, but it's not, you're, you're right, it is not a confrontation with what Islam actually meant to Algerians. Um, nor does he really confront the fact that uh, there was a wing of the Algerian movement, uh, the Association of the Algerian Ulema, who had a kind of neo-traditionalist understanding of Islam, and who saw the revolution as an occasion to reinforce this neoconservatism. So uh, I, I'm not sure if it's Marxian or not, but it's certainly a view of religion which assumes, I think, a kind of modernist linear narrative that eventually this kind of relig this, this, um, this um, religious politics will, um, will wane. Um, and I think this is one reason why Fanon was so attractive to a radical leftist sort of third tier mondiste readership because you know, it made the Algerian revolution look like a modernist struggle. Um, it was not, nor was it a universal struggle as he attempted to cast it. But I don't think that Fanon um, is unique in that regard. There were others who were, you know, uh, I think who were trying to do the same thing. And what's more, it's not unusual on the part of foreign born revolutionaries who go to a country and end up developing this deep attachment to the struggle, but also end up foisting certain meanings on the struggle, which are not those of the people who are really involved in the revolution. This was true of some of the observers of the Spanish Civil War. You know, and Algeria was in a sense the Spanish Civil War of North Africa at that time. I think we have to make good on being an open conversation and now is maybe the time to uh, ask the uh, audience whether anyone wants to um, have a comment or question or intervene on one of the issues that you raised. The mic is there and maybe there's a second one. Just raise your hands and also please say who you are because we cannot see you from here. <laughs> I hope that answers your question. Thank you so much. Okay, okay. okay. Hi, good evening. My name is Ruth. Um, I'm interested uh, in your very revealing remark at the very beginning about how you were interested in Algeria because in some sense it displaced for you the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. I wonder if you could tell us a bit more about that and why um, it became so important to displace it and how that affected the writing. Um, and is, is that the identification with Fanon that you have to be outside the Israeli-Palestinian? <laughs> You know, I'm just wondering, given what you just were saying about the outsider-insider yeah. dynamic, 
whether or not there is something there, which again gives you that a, a certain epistemological distance mm. that you say is a privilege, mm. which is something that you know uh, Nadia's question raises. Mm. I'm just wondering. Yes. No, it's a really good question. Thank you. I, I haven't really been, I, I, I have not been outside of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in over 20 years. <laughs> so I'm not particularly displaced from it. But, but no, no, but, but you're right. In the, in the late 90s, I think, you know, well, I, I can, actually, I can give you a pretty straightforward answer to that question. I, um, I already had strong feelings about, about Israel-Palestine um, in, the, in the late 90s. I mean, really, this, my, my interest in that issue and my uh, positions on that issue uh, uh, took shape when I was a teenager uh, during, during, during the first intifada. So um, it was more a matter of the fact that um, when I became a journalist um, in the mid-late 1990s, um, I, I, I actually wasn't really certain that I would be able to uh, write about that issue because of the rather constricted parameters of the political conversation in the United States. Um, and in fact, I'll, I'll tell you a story that um, speaks directly to that point, and it, it, it involves Fanon. In 2001, uh, David Macy, uh, a British uh, intellectual historian uh, published uh, a, a biography of Fanon, a uh, great biography. Yeah, it's a very, very, it's a very, very fine book. Um, and uh, I reviewed this book for the New York Times, um, uh, not knowing, of course, that you know, years later, I would, I would, I would, I would try my own, you know, try to write my own biography of Fanon. And. In that review, um, I referred at some, I, I think I, I said that uh, Fanon's writings uh, would reveal more about the dynamics of the, the, the struggle or conflict in Palestine than a year's worth of, of op-eds, something to that effect. And I, I probably was thinking of New York Times op-eds, frankly. Um, and my, uh, my editor at the New York Times Book Review uh, called me up. This was actually a period in which we still used phones and called people. And, uh, and she said, you know, everything's fine with the review, but, you know, when we publish reviews involving foreign affairs, uh, we have to present these pieces first to the foreign desk. And according to the editor at the foreign desk, there, there is no country called Palestine, so you're going to have to change this reference. So um, I, I, I just changed it to Middle East. I mean, at that time, uh, the Middle East uh, could be like the synecdoche for the entire, um, you know, pal for, the, for, for Israel, Palestine. So, um, uh, but that in itself was an indicate, I think an indication of just how, um, how narrow uh, the conversation was. And I, and I think that, you know, a lot of people who write on, on Israel, Palestine succumb to this um, uh, illusion. This is true, of, also true of Palestinians, it's true of Israelis, and it's true of many of those who um, become impassioned about this subject. They assume that it has no uh, precursor at all, that, it's, that it is totally sui generis. Um, and, and it's not, it's, it's, a, it's very distinctive in some ways. I mean, there, you know, there are aspects of this, of this history which uh, distinguish it from you know other cases of um, of um, other cases of settler colonialism. Um, obviously, one is that uh, Zionism was both a settler colonial movement and a national movement. So it was it was certainly different in that regard from certain other settler colonial movements. Um, and there are a whole host of other differences that we don't even need to get into. Um, but I, I felt that by um, by thinking about uh, the case of Algeria, I was able in some way to deprovincialize my understanding of the Israel-Palestine conflict. Um, I also found that there were, there, were, um, there were similarities that I had never imagined. I mean, for example, uh, one of the um, uh, distinctions you know, usually drawn between uh, Israel-Palestine and, and some of these other cases is that um, is that uh, the uh, the Jews who settled 
um, in Palestine, unlike other um, uh, uh, colonial groups, um, could trace a s ancestry um, to the land. In other words, they had an ancestral tie. There, are, there had historically always been a Jewish presence in Palestine. Um, and, and this argument is often uh, trotted out um, for all, all, not always, but often for ideological reasons. And um, I was struck by the fact that um, there had been a, um, a French thinker named Louis Bertrand um, who articulated what was kind of a French Algerian Zionism. I mean, his argument was that when the French uh, settled uh, Algeria, they weren't so much arriving in Algeria or invading Algeria as returning to what was a Latin territory. And of course, they drew upon things like the ruins of Tipaza uh, to argue that. And in, in that sense, uh, Albert Camus, even though you know, his relationship to colonialism is, a, is an anguished and complex one, Camus ve very much took part in that, in that discourse. And so you know, I, I think that Algeria gave me uh, a historical case that allowed me to both um, forge connections and also to see the dissimilarities and to free myself from the claustrophobia of the Israel-Palestine case and then to return to it with fresh eyes. Um, and I do think that, um, that Fanon's writings on the inherently violent nature of the colonial confrontation um, have a lot of resonance um, when applied to um, uh, the West Bank, you know, and the struggle between uh, Palestinians and settlers who have been confiscating their lands. I think, you know, much of what Fanon had to say about the, the darker aspects of anti-colonial struggle and the sort of the desire to uh, become a perpetrator the desire, rather than a victim I think those also can, can teach us a lot about the surplus nature of October 7, which began as a guerrilla raid on, um, on uh, military fortresses, but then developed into um, a massacre um, in the kibbutz and, uh, and, um, and at, the, uh, at the rave. So Fanon, I think, you know, helps us to think about violence. Um, he's not, I mean, it's, it's true that Fanon was a, was an advocate of armed struggle, we can talk about that, but he's also someone who's thinking about the psychological dynamics of violence. And um, that was one of the reasons why I found his work to be so stimulating with respect to, to Israel-Palestine. There's a, a hand over there. So it's not really a question, it's, just, um, it's rather a pushback against something you say, Nicola. Correct me if I'm wrong, but at some point you were saying that uh, movements like La Negritude right now are not that read anymore, that people like Sangor are not that relevant for the youth today. Uh, and I just wanted to push back against that because uh, in my world, there are always still references. I did black studies, African studies, and I had professors who were doing African studies. And they, they are still, even if when we talk about blackness today, their work informs the, the work around uh, blackness. And I ju I'm just saying it because I think it's really important to say where, from where we're talking, uh, we're talking, because we risk then rep repeating um, Eurocentric, um, uh, Eurocentric things. And in the same way that Fanon was quote unquote rediscovered in the last few decades, in, in Europe when it was always relevant on American campuses, especially among black students. So I just wanted to say that because we tend to make general remarks when it's I, very important to, to no, state I, from where we're talking I, from. I, appreci I appreciate that comment. And I think actually you're referring to something that Nicola said, not that I said, because I, I actually would never argue that Sangor, Césaire, and the French thinkers of Negritude have ceased to be important. They're, 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 they remain hugely important. Um, absolutely, um, and uh, uh, I write about Césaire, Sangor, and, and Léon Gontran Damas um, uh, with great respect and admiration um, in this book. Um, in no way do I think that, uh, that the question of negritude is historically obsolete, not at all. And in fact, if you, uh, if you read uh, the work of, of uh, 
French black writers today, whether they're in France or they're uh, writing in, in, in Francophone countries, uh, there, are, there remain very important references to, to Songor and to Césaire, who are, of course, you know, very, very different. And then you have, and then you have the, uh, the, the, uh, the movement of creolité and of the poetics of relation of Édouard Glissant, who uh, is um, uh, in some ways a, an heir of both Césaire and Fanon, and who takes uh, Fanon's ideas in a very different direction because he's not preoccupied in the way that Fanon was with the question of national sovereignty. I mean, let's remember Fanon was writing in an era when uh, the aim of political struggle appeared to be the creation of sovereign and independent nation states. You know, na even though Fanon is a critic of nationalism in some ways, he's very much a believer in the centrality of national consciousness as a prelude to a, a more sort of international federation of African states or of independent states in the French um, Antilles. So, um, and Glissant frees himself of the centrality of sovereignty to develop what he calls this poetics of relation. So, um, I, you know, I, I think it's in some ways, you know, here I, would, I very much, you know, um, and I'm very sympathetic to your line of thinking because there is a very rich tradition of reflection by black French thinkers. And I find it somewhat sad that some young readers feel moved to turn to Americans like James Baldwin or, or Richard Wright or, or Angela Davis uh, when they have a, a, a very, very rich tradition to develop of their own. So um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very much in, in, in agreement with, with what you've just said. There's a hand over there. I think, you know, the other thing that's important to realize is that, and I, I just want to say a little more about your question because I think it's a, a very important one, is that when Fanon turned to American writers like, like Richard Wright, he was doing so because he felt there was something in Wright that he wasn't getting in a writer like Césaire as much as he admired Césaire. And, and Fanon was much closer to Césaire's positions than he was to Songor. Césaire had a very creative, anti-essentialist understanding of blackness. After all, he's a new world thinker who is trying to uh, reflect on what it means to have grown up in a plantation society rather than in an ancestral homeland, rather than in Africa. Songor has this vision of at the African personality that is eternal and immute, immutable and very mystical, very influenced by, um, by his own Catholicism as well. So, you know, Fanon is turning to these American thinkers like, like Himes and Wright because they're writing about, particularly about the relationship between violence and identity. They're writing about it essentially in a very existential way that speaks to Fanon, the reader of Sartre, the, the black existentialist. He didn't find that in, these, in the West Indian thinkers. He could have found it, I think, in Suzanne Césaire's work. And, and in this book, I, I, uh, I write extensively about Suzanne Césaire because I think in many ways, Fanon's work bears more of a resemblance to the writings of Suzanne rather than to her husband, Aimé Césaire. And we could, of course, talk about the very significant black female thinkers like the Nardal sisters who also took part in the creation of, of Negritude. Um, it's, it's, it's not uncommon for people to look outside their own traditions when they find that there's something missing or that they perceive to be missing in their own. Um, one of the reasons that Fanon um, did so is that he was also very disappointed by some of the political positions that Césaire had taken after the war, particularly the departmentalization of, um, of Martinique. Fanon regarded the departmentalization as a betrayal of anti-colonial struggle. He was also very saddened by the fact that Leopold Songor stood with France against Algeria. 
Um, and, and, you know, Sangor took up positions that were quite conciliatory toward France at the very moment that Césaire was urging people to become Algerianized. So, you know, when, when, we, when we read Fanon on these thinkers, we always have to contextualize the positions that he's taking because they're never purely intellectual. They always reflect the dynamics of whatever political struggle is going on at the time. I, that's a, I mean, I would like to come back to the, in the, in the next few minutes about the question of blackness, which I think is, is central. Um, but before the next question, I just want to say what, what I meant was that not so much that negritude is not important per se, it's obviously part of a very important intellectual and political tradition. But what I found uh, remarkable is that over time, clearly, and that comes, comes out very strongly in your book, Fanon remains a major reference. While negritude is something that was central back then, less so it seems today, and he remains, while well, he's actually, and you show that very well, a critic of negritude, especially in the Sangor version, less so when it comes to Césaire, but that's because of his relationship to Césaire, but he's actually very wary of the political implications even of Césaire's version of negritude. He is. Say. So that's, that's what I meant. Yeah, he is, and I think, sense, I mean, part of it is that the writing is less old-fashioned. There's something, there's something, I mean, Fanon is like a dazzling anachronism. There's so much in Fanon that, that is obsolete, yeah. but there's, but, and yet the writing feels so contemporary. You read it and you feel like he's talking to you. Yeah. So, you know, it's partly the writing. There was a question. Yes, uh, uh, good evening. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Anastasia and I'm a PhD researcher here at the UI. I wanted to take this as an opportunity to invite you revisit or go a bit deeper um, to the tension between uh, decolonization and nationalism and the convoluted and difficult relationship, uh, and especially the tension between the agenda of the decolonial thinkers, uh, which can be um, you know, summarized or presented through pan-Africanism, which is transnational, and the implementation of the decolonial agenda and the movements towards self-determination that uh, were packaged as, as nation states and essentially nationalist projects. If you could speak a bit more on that, thank you. Sure, sure. You know, it's fun, you know, I, you know, if you would use the word decolonial with Fanon, you would have no idea what you're talking about. Because, you know, that's, that's, that's a word that we use today, and it's not a word that he used. He was an anti-colonial thinker. Um, but, um, you know, Fanon drew, Fanon uh, uh, wrote very critically about, um, about nationalism in, in, in Wretched of the Earth because he, you know, he was concerned, uh, concerned essentially about the emergence of what he called the national bourgeoisie. You know, he, was, he was concerned that, that a group of people who um, had connections to uh, the West, who had links to foreign companies, um, would put themselves forward as the uh, leaders of independent struggles um, and who uh, would, would essentially do nothing uh, for the uh, masses of colonized people uh, once, um, uh, once uh, independence uh, was won. Um, there, in fact, there's a, there's a passage in, in The Wretched of the Earth where he uh, describes the new national leader who organizes a, a kind of celebration um, on the day that independence was won and everyone is invited to come and, and celebrate the great movement that liberated them. And then they're told to, you know, to go home and to mind their own business and to stay out of politics. And, and, and that's essentially what he, was, what, what, he was, uh, what he was concerned about. He thought that, that nationalism uh, would become a kind of uh, opium, an opium of the masses, as it were, um, that would be a replacement, a surrogate for a social revolution that would permit uh, the poor and the disenfranchised who had always been the greatest victims of colonialism, it would prevent them from, uh, from participating in political processes and from experiencing a true liberation. What, what Fanon, Fanon well, the problem that Fanon was confronting in uh, The Wretched of the Earth, which is both a an inspirational manifesto and a book full of warnings. You know, it's a very, it's an a book full of apocalyptic warnings almost. Um, his preoccupation is the road from liberation to freedom. 
because when Fanon wrote The Wretched of the Earth, he was in no doubt that, the, that these independent struggles were going to win. He was writing on the side of the winners at the time. These empires were falling. It's 1961. These empires are not going to remain in place. His concern was about what comes afterward. Are we actually going to be able to create the conditions of freedom? Or will these be countries that have been formally liberated, but which are in a sense still captive either to a national bourgeoisie or to, uh, to Western economic and political interests or to the two of them working in tandem? Um, national consciousness, on the other hand, was something that Fanon considered to be an indispensable part of the process of liberation and of the post-independent state. And essentially what he's arguing is that national consciousness is something that is created in movement. It's created in the course of a liberation struggle. It's not about the search for a culture uh, which has been uh, suppressed or suffocated by the colonizer. It's not, a, it's not an active return, it's an active invention. When I say this, by the way, I'm not saying I believe this because actually I think any national movement has to draw upon local indigenous symbols and cultural traditions. I think it's a, there is a, a, a kind of radical modernism in Fanon's argument about national consciousness that bears no relationship to what actually happens on the ground. You know, it really goes back to what Nadia was saying. It is impossible to imagine an Algerian nationalism fighting the French, which did not draw upon Islam. Impossible. So, um, but Fanon's view was that this, this, this new invention, this national consciousness would um, give confidence um, and a kind of emotional power to people in their struggle and that national consciousness would, would, would show none of the, um, the xenophobic or um, prejudicial aspects of, of traditional nationalism, that it would be a kind of um, bridge to a wider international consciousness. Fanon hoped that eventually these African states with their new invented national consciousnesses could then forge a unity, you know, an, uh, a kind of federation, a United States of Africa. Each state would have its own national consciousness but they would be in dialogue with each other. And uh, you know, Fanon's concern was that um, in the aftermath of independence, uh, there would be a return, a regression to political sectarianism, to what he called tribalism. And he had reason to be concerned about this because there actually were um, cases in which after independence, uh, 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 foreigners were, were harassed. They were the subjects, they were the objects of, of violence. And this continued to be the case. And he observed some of that. And he also um, observed a fair amount of racism expressed by his own colleagues in the movement against their, uh, against their African partners. So Fanon was very, although Fanon prioritized the struggle against Western racism, against Eurocentrism, he also understood that racism existed everywhere and that post-colonial states had to be very vigilant about, fight, uh, uh, about the possibility of intolerance and racism within their own ranks. Can I, we, we don't have that much time left and we, we're actually not even halfway in the, in the questions we wanted to ask you. But, um, but there'll be time over drinks. But um, just a couple before closing, um, I had one question that flows from the previous exchange about negritude and blackness. Um, by sheer coincidence, uh, while reading your book, I was reading a review by Adam Gadachu of several books by Louise Chuda Soke about blackness in America. And in the New York a, Review. Yes, and she's, she's a brilliant thinker mm -hmm. and writer. And um, at some point in the review, she writes, I'm quoting her, the African-American quest for emancipation and equality has come to stand in for larger struggles of racialized and colonized people around the world. And it's true that post Black Lives Matter and so on and so forth, this is a global lexicon of emancipation has been diffused. But what struck me uh, is that I was reading your book at the same time. And it's striking that in Fanon's time, it's almost the opposite. In the sense that it was the anti-colonial struggles that were looked up to as a model for emancipation in the United States to some extent. And that's something that comes across some of What do you think, what do you think, um, why this inversion? 
If, and maybe you don't agree with the inversion. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, I'm not, I'm not sure that's the case. I mean, I, I think that, I mean, it is interesting that America now provides this, this, this model because, um, you know, America keeps declining and yet, yet somehow it, its soft power remains. Um, I mean, it's, it's like that uh, scene in Diabolique when the bathtub, when the woman's head keeps coming up. Um, so, um, you know, I, I mean, I think that the, the, the civil rights struggle was, um, was, was, you know, was hugely um, significant and, and inspiring to people. I mean, there's a reason why Martin Luther King, you know, ends up in Ghana in 1957 at the at Independence when Nkrumah, Nkrumah is, in, is inaugurated, um, and there was a, there was quite a bit of dialogue between between those movements. Many, of course, many African Americans in SNCC um, went to uh, post-independence states um, in the early 1960s. Um, uh, so. Um, there's always a lot of va and vien between, you know, between these back movements. To your father's book being, you know, lodged next to Malcolm X. You know. Well, you know, I think what's, you know, what's what I try to, you know, argue in the in in this biography is that, um, you know, Fanon is a thinker who um, was, of course, very important to um, uh, to anti-colonial thought, to various um, insurgent movements. Um, uh, the Palestinians, of course, um, have long been interested in Fanon. He was read in Palestinian training camps in the late 1960s, the Fedayeen in Jordan and Lebanon. Um, he was important to Iranian revolutionaries, to Latin Americans. Che Guevara arranged for the first translation of The Wretched of the Earth in Latin America. Um, it was in France that he was at risk of, of disappearing. The French were very eager to move on from Fanon, partly because Fanon was a reminder of a war that they were determined to forget. Um, and Fanon was moreover, unlike Césaire, Fanon was the one who um, rejected France, you know, and, and he was, he's never been really forgiven for that. Um, so how is it that Fanon um, not only remained a, a reference point, but became came to acquire an even greater significance over the years. Yes, it's partly because of, of, of his importance to um, anti-colonial struggles and eventually post-colonial thought. And, but I, but I, do, I, I insist in this book that Fanon was rescued from oblivion uh, by black Americans um, in the late 1960s. Uh, he was, you know, of course, translated into um, English in the mid-60s, first Wretched of the Earth, and black skin, white masks, and he was read by black psychiatrists um, who were interested in questions of what was then called black rage and also of the complexities of, of, uh, and, and, and challenges experienced uh, by black students in predominantly white schools because Fanon had, 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 had written extensively about that in black skin, white masks. There was also the Black Panthers, you know, the Black Panthers and there's this myth about the Black Panthers. Um, and the myth goes like this, that somehow uh, Fanon was appealing to them because he believed in armed struggle, because it was all about you know, picking up a gun and shooting the pigs. And, and that's true. I mean, you know, there, there's a truth to that myth. You know, Fanon was a kind of French Malcolm X, and that's one of the reasons he was uh, so appealing to people like Eldridge Cleaver and, and, and Huey Newton. But another reason that, that Fanon was important to the Panthers, which is overlooked, uh, is that he brought to bear his psychiatric expertise and insight to the question of racism and the lived experience of being a racialized person in a racist white majority society. And for that reason, uh, Fanon was read um, by doctors and nurses who worked in the health clinics of the Black Panther Party. Fanon was required reading because of his essays on medicine and colonialism. Um, you know, he writes in that essay, which uh, is a chapter in uh, a Dying Colonialism in his 1959 book about Algeria. He writes in that essay about how for a, an Algerian person um, going to the doctor is an inherently hostile experience. 
And you know, African Americans immediately understood what that meant because if they weren't going to a black doctor, if they were going to a white doctor, they might be encountering a racist doctor with all sorts of faulty assumptions um, about black life. They, 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 every African American knew about the about medical malpractice cases like the Tuskegee experiments, in which a group of black men. Um, who, who, yes, and they and and they were never told about the syphilis that they suffered. They were used as guinea pigs, um, and you know we tend to forget that Fanon was not simply a psychiatrist who used psychiatry to analyze racism. He was also a critic of psychiatry, and 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 Fanon was up against a whole legacy of French colonial psychiatry that had been founded by the doctor Antoine Porot who um, had established uh, you know, a number of um, psychiatric institutions, both in Tunisia and Algeria, and it was Perot's belief that, the, that, that Algerians were mentally inferior. Um, and uh, so when Fanon got to the, the psychiatric hospital in Blida Joinville in uh, late 1953, he had colleagues who had been formed by that school of psychiatry. Um, so those writings were of great interest uh, to the Panthers and black Americans throughout the 60s, 70s, and 80s when Fanon was not being read in universities kept alive uh, his memory. I think we're slightly over time, but I would want Nadia to have the last word. The last question. Uh, well, I'll, I want to end with the question about the, the end of the world. <laughs> 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 so, you know, we could go on and on about whether or not we, we live in a Fanonian moment, which paradigms could we use, and I think we could never agree of, like, as you said, he says one thing and it seems outdated, and then another that seems very contemporary. And reading your um, amazingly moving account of Fanon, I was wondering if at the end of the day, what the, the ways in which Fanon is our contemporary, is maybe not through this or that paradigm, but through his, what comes across as his inability to enter his life and history. He seems, he seems to be haunted by, by, by the idea of dying and re, being reborn. Um, there's this, this quote at the end of the book when he has uh, leukemia that he's, that someone says he's haunted by the awareness of his death. Uh, and it reminded me of this uh, quote by this Lebanese poet, Nadia Twaini, Beirut has been a thousand times dead and a thousand times reborn. I find just there's some echoes of, and, and when you, to look back to the excerpt you read in the intro, uh, he, he wants, he, about Manuel, he's, 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 there's an ability to really build bond, bind bonds, and he talks about game, um, so, in a way, contrasting with, with all his rhetoric about the constitution of unifying masses marching through history, um, he comes across as a character on the run, always on the brink of collapse. He builds something amazing, then he goes to another place. <laughs> um, and in that respect, he sort of mirrors uh, a contemporary condition uh, of ours of always toying with the idea of the end of the world. Uh, we're toying with the idea of the Third World War, of Iran, of I mean, what's what, everything that's that's going on, and that very much contrasts with other accounts, uh, with other problematizations of the end of the world, like Césaire, this, this beautiful poem that you quote, uh, the only thing in the world that's worth beginning, the end of the world, mm -hmm. no less. Yet Césaire brings this in a sort of more poetic, generative mm -hmm. way. There's something mm -hmm. very brutal in the way. Fanon keeps dying and trying to be reborn. So is this that he, what he leaves us? He gives, gives us a sort of mirror of our condition, mm. um, uh, a sort of pre-apocalyptic condition and mm. of inability to enter history, to envisage this being reinscribed is in a long process of, of like uh, envis envisaging not just liberation, but even just uh, a future. Mm. I'm, I'm going to I'm going to have to mull over that one for a while, uh, Nadia. It's a very deep question. Um, uh, it is true that that this book 
turns to some extent on this contrast between Césaire and Fanon because Césaire, um, who was 14, I think about 15 years older than Fanon, Césaire was the, uh, the, was the Martinican writer who, who returns, right? He, uh, he's, he was living in Paris, he was on vacation in Yugoslavia, and that's when he begins to write uh, his notebook of return to the native land, and it's after that that he goes back to Martinique and he, uh, and he becomes a statesman. You know, he becomes a mayor, a senator. Um, he's, uh, for a period of time, he's in the Communist Party, then he leaves the Communist Party, but he remains tied to, wedded to Martinique and to a project of um, improving the lives of his fellow uh, Martinican citizens. French citizens in Martinique, the whole project of departmentalization. Um, and so in a sense, you know, uh, Césaire is a, um, is a revolutionary poet, but a very pragmatic politician who, um, whatever his words may say about the end of the world, to some extent accepts the boundaries of that world and tries to work within it as a radical reformist. Fanon is the writer who leaves and doesn't return. And that's one of the reasons why he uh, ends up being viewed um, in Martinique with a fair amount of suspicion, um, sometimes even with contempt. Um, uh, I don't think that's fair, but, but he's the one who is regarded as having abandoned uh, his country. It's one of the reasons why, Aimé, why uh, Albert Memmi writes so critically of him in his retrospect of Fanon's life the Impossible Life of Franz Fanon, which he published uh, in Esprit 10 years after his death. Fanon, instead of embracing the reform-minded political project of negritude and reconciling himself to his own West Indian identity, instead aligns himself with a foreign revolution, a revolution of quote-unquote white Muslims, and tries to make a revolution among people who are strangers to him. And, and I, you know, I, I, I don't, I, I take, to some extent, uh, Memmi's periodization of Fanon's life, but I don't, I don't accept the conclusion. I actually find that there's something inspiring, uh, attractive, and exciting about Fanon's nomadism um, and his restlessness. Um, I'm, I'm not saying that it's a model. I, I certainly want, wouldn't want to live that life. I mean, Fanon chose a, a very dangerous life. He was a professional revolutionary, essentially, who, um, went into exile and could never return to his home. Um, it's hardly a model for most of us. Um, but um, I think that he was putting certain questions on the table that no one else did with the same kind of visceral candor. And, and, I, and, I, and I, I'm not saying that we're in a Fanonian moment. I don't even know what a Fanonian moment really would be. But I do think that some of the things that we've seen in the last, it'll, soon, it'll be the, the last year, very soon, um, I think um, um, should encourage us to go back uh, to Fanon. Um, uh, you know, his understanding of the inevitability of violent resistance in cases of violent domination and humiliation. You know, Fanon underscored that relentlessly. And it's, I think it's a point that's very uncomfortable for some people. They, they would like to imagine that people who have been oppressed and victimized um, will somehow be ennobled by their oppression and that they'll fight back with, you know, with, with, with peaceful or conciliatory means. But if they're afforded no other option, if they have no political horizon whatsoever, if they have been treated essentially as subhumans, unworthy of the same kind of lives that other people lead, it is very likely that they'll, they will respond in very violent and potentially very ugly ways. I think Fanon also was very evocative in describing the response of their oppressors. And you know, Fanon wrote about what he called the exhibitionist nature of colonial violence, the need to, to constantly remind the oppressed person of his or her place. Um, not long after uh, the October 7 attacks, the uh, defense minister of Israel, Yoav Gallant, who was the mastermind too of the 
current uh, violent campaign against Lebanon, uh, describe Palestinians as animals. They're animals, and we will treat them accordingly. Uh, in The Wretched of the Earth, Fanon writes that the, for the, for, that, that the colonist um, will often turn to the language of the bestiary. You know, he was writing about dynamics which are regrettably still very present in this particular conflict, which is of concern not merely to the people who are involved in it, the Israelis and the Palestinians, but to the wider region and to us as well. Um, I want to, you know, add another note about that. Fanon was someone who, you know, was of course very identified with the, um, the Algerian struggle, with the African struggle, but he was also someone who understood the connections between different forms of racism. You know, he writes at some point that the, that the, um, the anti-Semite is almost invariably a Negrophobe. I think Fanon would have had a lot to say about um, the question of anti-Semitism as well, something that's often you know, misunderstood, and the connections between anti-Semitism and anti-Arab racism. And I think he would have had much to say about the instrumentalization of anti-Semitism um, in justifying uh, crimes committed uh, by a state of former victims who have become perpetrators. And I think um, you know, this is a voice uh, that remains very pertinent in our own time, but with this one uh, caveat. Fanon is insistent that, um, that the, um, what defines us as humans and um, is, is our ability to, to, uh, to reinvent ourselves, the leap of invention. And so I think that when we, when we read Fanon, we, uh, we, uh, we, make him, we, we, we err if we read him in a liturgical fashion, if we read him as someone who is presenting us with a set of answers. The last line of Black Skin, White Masks is, oh my body, make of me always a man who questions. I don't think that we're doing a great service to Fanon if we look to him for answers rather than for help in asking our own questions. So if we read him creatively and ethically, I think that we're being proper Fanonians. Um, but I think that that leap of invention is something that we too have to take. Well, on this call to be proper Fanonians, I wanna thank you, Adam, and you, Nadia, for a great conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much.